Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5 at first verse, he said, Therefore, be an imitator of God as dear children. Be an imitator of God as dear children. What a weighty command when we give a little bit of thought to that. We need to be an imitator. So if you want to take out your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to be looking at the first few verses there through verse 7 of chapter 5. And we're going to grab just a few verses in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Welcome uh, visitors that we have with us this evening. Uh, grateful that you came back and they'll welcome you back with us anytime you have opportunity. Donnie is away in a meeting as he previously announced to some of us men will get in and fill in at times during his absence. So I'm grateful for this opportunity. Count you as a friend and a brother. If I say something that's uh, out of line with the scriptures, you bring that to my attention. I will uh, promise you I will make correction for that immediately. So we're going to look at uh, being an imitator this morning. We're going to look at these points. The reasons for us to be an imitator. We're going to look at the definition behind the imitator. We're going to look at being uh, as dear children, imitating as dear children. Walking in love as dear children. Walking as Christ. Imitating Christ, fitting and not fitting. What is being an imitator and what's fitting to us as we try to be an imitator uh, and not being deceived. As we imitate God, we do not need to be uh, deceived. And then finally is being aware of sin. We can't be uh, imitators if we're not aware of sin and pay attention to that. So we're going to jump into 4. As this chapter starts out there in verse 1, you'll see what Paul, he started out with therefore. And, and that means for that reason. So there is a reason that, that, we're going to, that we should look at what's to come in this chapter 5. Now, let's grab, there are more reasons, of course, than the three I'm going to look at. We're going to look at three in chapter 4, but there are more reasons in this chapter. But these three, as I went back and reviewed it, I thought, you know, these, these three carry more weight to me uh, maybe than some of the others. Or maybe I just got more of a practical point out of these but the first is giving place to the devil. And he talks about not letting the sun go down your, your wrath, your anger. And it gives place to the devil. Give place to the devil when we're trying to be an imitator. We can't give place to the devil. We can't give place to the devil at our table. We can't give place to the devil in our homes. We can't give place to the devil in our lives. We just need to make sure that we're not giving place to the devil and how easy we can do that. Now... Think about being an imitator. That helps us prevent. If we're an imitator of God diligently, that will prevent the devil from taking a place in our life. He also says we can grieve the, the Holy Spirit of God. They're in verse 30. We can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. If we meditate on that, that the Holy Spirit... Is, is able to see what we're doing. That's a spiritual understanding that we have, that the Holy Spirit's able to see, and we're able to grieve the Holy Spirit. His presence is that close to us that our actions can bring, bring grief upon the Holy Spirit of God. Being an imitator of God, it helps prevent that grief upon the Holy Spirit. And as we think about being a Imitator, what better reason? What better reason to see, to imitate God? Because God in Christ, He forgave us. God in Christ forgave us. What better reason for us to be an imitator? That we have salvation. That God in Christ has given us salvation. And we can be made right by His blood. So let us imitate Him. So let's look at the definitions. Go to King James, it's going to be called a follower. Be a follower. It means in service. Who adheres to the teachings and the opinion. To be a follower. That we adhere to that. We also find another definition to mimic. And that's to copy. The key word is copy closely. Resemble closely and copy an action or speech. To mimic. So being this imitator is to follow and mimic. And then when we look at the imitators used in New King James Version... We're going to copy it again. We're going to copy an action or behavior or another. You've seen people, comedians that try to copy. They try to get as close as possible to the person they're copying or the person they're imitating. 
That's their job, is to get it just almost exactly like the person they are imitating. This Paul's writing to the Christians. That's what you're supposed to do is imitate. Get as close as you can. Close as you can. Term as dear children. It's probably as I was reading through it the first, that was the, the phrase that really got me, is as dear children. What does it mean? Um, as a dear children. We think about that phrase. Um, to get us there, we've got to first consider about, you know, what's God done for us? What's God done for us? How's He treat us? Gives, us? gives us everything we need, supplies everything, and the greatest of all that is, is His plan that was implemented, sending His Son to fulfill that plan that we may have salvation. He gives us a mind to choose. He supplies everything to us. Everything around us. Just look around at all the blessings. How blessed we are here today to have each other. What a blessing it is for us to have our relationships. God's part of God's family. As dear children, you think about a son that may follow his father's footsteps. And you've seen this where Boys will try to follow their father and they just admire their father so much and they want to do nothing to displease their father. That's, a, that's dear children. Do nothing to displease him. Near and dear to our heart. That's the other thing about uh, being a dear child, that it's near and dear to our heart. It's very close. It's something that we put a great amount of value upon. Great value being a dear child. It's first. It almost be first. There's nothing in our lives that would hold more value than this, than this. Being a dear child of God. And it's caring deeply about that relationship. That that relationship comes first in our life. That's how we show that we're a dear child to God. It's how a dear child treats their parents. They, they value that relationship. It means more than anything else. And he tells to walk in love. Let's read that. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us. Now think about this term, walk in love. It's a point I've, th I've thought about before. That as we think about walk, <clears throat> one of those definitions said move at a regular pace. I thought that's good. That's good for a Christian. We need to hear that. That we, that we walk at this regular pace. That, that we're steady in it, see? That, that we continue on. And we want to think about the Bible providing us a definition for walk, there it is. You walk in my ways, and what do we do? Keep my statutes and my commandments. That's how you walk. Let the Bible define it. The Bible's going to define us. We saw Donnie's lesson of, um, talking about the, the Bible defining words. Uh, we see that if we look. But here we see walking defined by keeping. When we think about love and walking... I've said this before, it's not, it's not an emotion, okay? We can't look as Christians loving each other, loving God and Christ. It's, it's not this bubbly emotion we're waiting for in our lives. It is, a, it is something we do intentionally. That's that walk, that move at a regular pace. That, that's an intentional, something we choose to do. Not wait for something to come upon us, well, I just don't feel like loving them, or, or they, you know, I just don't want to do it. No, it's a command. It is a command to do. The fact of love is you're deeply committed and connected. It goes right back to that keeping. That you're committed, you're connected. First John, if you do not love, you do not know God. It tells us it's possible. It tells us we must do it. If it's commanded, it's possible. Our example is Christ. As He loved us, as we look there in verse 2, as He loved us. And we think about the life of Christ, we go back as we've studied on the life of Christ and think about the love that He had for us. First thing it says is he given, He's given Himself. We're going to get into other aspects of His life, but the first thing I thought is He, given, he, he gave Himself to the work of the Lord. Put aside earthly things, as family walked away from him, he walked away from them. He gave himself to the work of the Lord. He gave himself for the church. 
put aside all the other worldly things. He was made an offering of, and grat- this is gratitude expressed and surrender possession. When you think about Christ giving himself, he gave up everything to surrender to the will of the Father. And that made him this offering. And you look at, uh, you go back and think about what we saw in Leviticus and some of those Old Testament laws about an offering. The offering is that, uh, usually that first fruit. It could be a, not a blood sacrifice, but the offering would be maybe the first fruits. Uh, a showing of gratitude. When the people came to the temple, it's a show of gratitude. of Those first fruits, the best. And they were to come up with the free will offering. It was to be by their free will. God didn't want it. God didn't want it if it was not a free will offering something that you gave voluntarily. Remember that? Go back and study that. Free will offering. And we see Christ is he giving he gave himself away completely. And it was all the way up to the blood offering of a sacrifice as we see here. Giving himself us an offering and a sacrifice to God. That sacrifice you pertain to the, to the animals, and that would be a blood sacrifice. And that's how we can relate that back to, to Christ, because he gave himself up all the way up to death and offered his blood on the cross. That blood is what cleanses us. We think about letting Christ be our example. He, isn't he the only true pattern that the Christian should have? Isn't it Christ? He's the only true pattern. He's the only true example. And the true example of love, to give himself up and face death, face crucifixion, face that pain and agony. Lastly, he calls it a sweet-smelling aroma. Remember this morning, Ephesians, we're going to let the... uh, We're going to let the Bible give us another definition in this. In 4.18 of Philippians, we saw that this morning. It goes back to this. Let the Bible give us some definitions to help us understand clearly. In Philippians 4.18, a sweet-smelling aroma. And what is it? What helps us understand what a sweet-smelling aroma is? It's an acceptable sacrifice, and it is well-pleasing to God. That... Is a sweet-smelling aroma. I want to talk about a few points right here when we think about Christ as our example and our lives as Christians and us trying to be that imitator and some points, that, some practical points we should take home. It's when should, the, when should the Christian be at his absolute best and when should we put on our best? At what point in our life, in our daily routine, should we put on our best? Is it not for the worship service? I think we all agree it is, right? That every day of our life should be offering sacrifice and everything we do. But putting on our best should be the worship service, right? Best in our singing, best in our attention best in our attitude, best in our love. It should be our absolute best every time we come to a worship service. And I, I see this in some of my travels, going to small churches where uh, it, it just doesn't matter what you put on. Heard uh, some uh, men talk about that, that uh, it don't matter. Some women say it don't matter. Conversations people have, it don't matter what you wear to service. And I thought about that. I said, you know, we don't want to be some kind of whitewashed vessel that's not, that just looks at the outside, not the inside. I get all that. I get that. But you know what I don't get? Is we'll use more attention and more thought to putting clothes on ourselves, going out into the world, doing anything else. But we got some people that won't put that into the thought coming before our God. Put more thought into going out in the yard working 
than you will coming into the service or put more thought into it going out to eat. How much effort is spent at a wedding, preparing a wedding on the, on the attire of the, the bridesmaids, of the groom? How much time and attention is spent on getting all that right? Everything's got to be just perfect for that wedding. It comes to, uh, let's say, a memorial service. We're going, to, uh, we're going to a funeral, and we're laying to rest our grandmother or our mother or father, and, you know, we think about what we're going to wear to this. This is a memorial service for our parents or our grandparents, somebody I love dearly. How much thought we put into that? What about a graduation? How much thought we put into to going to a graduation service, somebody that's, you know, achieved a high honor. It's a special day. It's a special day for this person. They've just graduated and they've moved on, they moved up. This is, this is a great day. How much, how much attention and thought we put into that? Well, I, as I think about that, I'm like, let me think about something. I think we have a memorial service right here every Sunday, don't we? Every Sunday, a memorial service. The greatest sacrifice ever given. Every Sunday. What about a wedding? Think about that. You ever, think, you ever heard of this? Christ is the bridegroom, and we are the bride. You ever thought about that? Church is his bride, right? Ain't he the bridegroom? You read that in Revelations. We find that in other places, in some parables. Think about that. What about a graduation? You ever see a graduation in here? I think you did. May not think about it. Young person comes in here and is dipped in that water. What did he just do? What did they just do? Just graduated out of a life of sin into the kingdom of God. Greatest honor. Greatest honor anyone would ever have. You just watched a memorial, a wedding, and a graduation. All three, every Sunday. And, and it don't matter what we wear. I think it does. I think it does. We need to put some thought in that. This is the greatest honor we'll ever have coming in here. There's no other uh, assembly, no other event that we go to that that's, means more to us and carries more weight than this assembly, than this coming together. And we are to be an offering. We are to be an imitator of Christ. An offering and a sacrifice to God in us. Be a sweet smelling aroma. Well pleasing to God. Put on your best. And we need not use less effort and thought into this than we would anything else in our life. It needs to be the top priority to us. I go out to Arkansas to that church and, and if you don't think it matters... I, 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 I wouldn't take pictures in the assembly at all. But I just wish I had a picture I could show you. If you, think it, if you ever think it don't matter, fast forward with that attitude amongst the men and women. If you have that, it don't matter. Okay, here comes your child. It don't matter. Okay, that child comes along. It don't matter. Well, you will see what I see in Arkansas. The guy gets up leading in worship, and he's got on a Nike t-shirt, shorts, and his work boots. And he's leading in the worship assembly, the worship to our God. And if you don't think it matters, just think about how you're going to feel if I got up here, I just walked out of the shop, and I've got my work clothes on. I didn't change. I just, whatever, you know, just whatever. I grab them, get up here, and I'm going to present the Word of God. I'm going to lead you in singing and worship. Does that matter to you? Does it matter to you? It should. It should matter. Because that attitude is going to permeate and it's going to get worse and worse through each generation. And the next thing you know, you can't tell, is, let's see, is this a work day at church or is this a beach party? We don't know what it is. Because you're not going to be able to tell. Because people are going to wear just whatever they grab first in their closet. And our God deserves better. He deserves better. Sacrifice offering a sweet-smelling aroma to our God. Be that imitator as Christ. Let us put on our best always and show appreciation for Him. There's some things fitting and not fitting for saints. 
Now, if you are in the mechanic industry or maybe you're in plumbing, you're going to understand this idea of fitting and not fitting. And we're going to say it in verse 3 and 4. He says, as is fitting for saints, and there's certain things that uh, should not even be named, and they're fitting and not fitting. And when you think about that, fitting is a part or a piece, and it is always attached. You work, you work with hydraulics or you work with plumbing, you know you have that fitting, and that fitting serves, that, that fitting serves a purpose. It is to bring these two pieces together, that fitting does. Woodworking, you're going to have pieces, we don't really refer to them as fittings, but, but you get the idea. And there are some things that are meant to be part and pieces and attached to us, and there are some things that are not. He said also, not even. What's that mean? That's that strong disappointment or disapproval, an emphatic no. There are just certain things that should not be fitted together with the assembly, with the Christians. And he says, don't even name it. Now, when you think about being named, that, in this context, he's naming sins. But we can also recall that when he talks about withdrawing from the disorderly, someone named a brother. Remember reading that? Anyone named a brother? Here he's talking about this, some things that are fitting and not fitting for saints. It's not to be named among us. It's not to be uh, fitted together and attached to us. And he may call it a sin or a person, but remember, it's the same thing. If he's calling out the sin, the sin is the attached to that person, not to be named among us. Um, and the reason why? Look at this. The definition of among is to influence, surround us, in the company of. The main term there is influence us. It's being careful about what we are fitting together as we're being imitators of Christ, what we are fitting together. Uh, amongst ourselves and what we're fitting together, what we're attaching ourselves to um, because we can fall under that influence. And notice this, that these things we're not fitted to, there's three things. They're not in the kingdom. We are not to be partakers with them and no fellowship. They have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That's verse 5. Let it not be named among you. Down in verse 7, don't be partakers with them. And in 11, no fellowship. So you can see here, there's certain things we should have fitted to us and there's certain things we need to keep at a distance from us. Uh, and they're not to be named among us. Uh, to be addressed and not to be overlooked. And then he says, don't be deceived. And I think, now why, would he, why would he throw that in there? He says, with his empty words, let no one deceive you with empty words. What's the empty words mean? That's vain words, or worthless words. What's, what does that tell us? What point do we get from that? That there will be people that try to deceive us. There will be people to try to deceive us. Now, what are they going to say? Just look around in the world and see what is accepted today. They, they'll say, well, God loves me. God loves me. It, you know, that sin of fornication or drunkenness, that don't matter. Homicide, it don't matter. God loves us. Friends, that's being deceived with some empty and vain words. That is being deceived. Don't be deceived about this, about the wrath of God. And we think about the wrath of God, that's not... Uh, it's not a vengeance type thing with God, but it's more to do with His rule of law. So I want you to ask you this question. What kind of God would we have? And you think about this in your workplace or think about this in society if there were no laws. Right? No rules at work. Just everybody does what they want to. No rules in society at all. What kind of God would that be? You know, we, we, just, we probably wouldn't have uh, much respect for that, would we? Because at work, do we? Do we respect our bosses when there's no rules? You know, do you, they just let everything go? But with God, it's not, it's not vengeance. It's, it's about a rule of law, and there has to be a rule of law, and there has to be discipline when the rule is not followed. And we do not need to be deceived that the wrath of God is going to come upon uh, 
the sons of disobedience. That there is a punishment coming. Don't be deceived by someone to tell you that the wrath is not coming because it is. It is coming. It does exist and it is coming. Our God is a righteous God and He's a just God and He wouldn't be without having a rule that is followed and it must be followed. Being aware of sin. As Christians, as being this imitator, we have to be aware of sin. In this section, he, ta- he talks about fornication. Fornication is a sin, and our young people need to be reminded of that every day because the world is not going to tell them any different. The world is going to tell them that's love. People, it's not love. It's lust, and there's a difference between love and lust. Lust and fornication hand in hand. Fornication is a sin, and it is filthiness. It's tied right to uncleanness. All three of those probably overlap if we did an in-depth study. We're not here to study each one of these individually, but uh, it's sometime you can study that. But you'll find that the fornication, the filthiness, filthy movies, filthy talk, filthy magazines, the filthy conduct of people, uh, uncleanness, um, just, just filthy people. Uh, and being aware of that sin. And making sure we're not caught. Well, he's a good man. Might be on the outside, but we need to know before we name a brother among us what kind of man he really is. This foolish talking and jesting. I've heard Christians saying it. It, it always makes me cringe when they say, "Well, I can't. I just can't help it to let a, a little foul word fly every now and then." Yes, you can. You can help it. You take it from me, because I was one of the filthiest mouth people ever, and I stopped it all immediately. No excuse for a Christian to ever let it come out of their mouth. It's foolish talking and it's jesting. It needs to stop. And if you're given to that, you need to pray about it, like Shannon's talking about this morning. You need to get it in your prayer and uh, pray about it often, because you've got a problem that needs to be addressed. Covetousness and idolatry kind of winding this up. We think about covetous as, as I was going into this lesson. I thought of covetous maybe, it's maybe wanting what somebody else has. And, and as I've done a little more study in that, I found out, well, maybe, maybe not, uh, it's not all just, you know, I want what my neighbor's got. Uh, we can look at Luke 12, 15. Remember this parable? I'm talking about this man. He, uh, had great uh, crops and his barns were filled. And what will I do? I'll tear down these barns and I'll build uh, bigger barns. And he says, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. So he didn't have a problem with his neighbor's, with his neighbor's stuff. He, 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 he had a problem with his belongings. That's what he coveted and, and, and he was laying up. He was laying up treasures for himself here on this earth. Covetousness is that, laying up treasures here. Emphasis is here, and it can be, it can be our idol. It can be our idol. And it's sad when, when we see someone that may be completely torn apart because of a dollar, because of money gets in their way of doing anything worried about that money. What we've got going on today in Ukraine, I would, I would challenge you to think about this, Some of these two and a, up to two and a half million people that have been uh, torn out of their country and probably lost everything they had within, what, 15 days? And if you've got a problem with covetous and you think about these people, that they just had to move out of their houses. They took one suitcase. They were able to only get a certain amount of money out of the bank, one suitcase, and that's it, and they're gone. And maybe a Russian missile didn't blow their house up, but maybe it did. So they've lost everything. And is that what, and, and think about yourself. What would you do if that were you? You have a problem with covetousness, with laying up treasures on this earth. 
and is it your idol or anything else that may stand in the way? And lastly, out of the Barnes commentary, I thought this was great. And that is, he bestows on money. Uh, now, this is talking about the covetous man. He bestows on money the affections due to God. And see, to worship money is a real idolatry as to worship a block of stone. How many idolaters are there in the professed Christian lands and how many it is to be feared in the church itself. And since every covetous man is certainly to be excluded from the kingdom of God, how anxious should we be to examine our hearts and to know whether this sin may not lie at our door. The sin may lie at our door and we don't even realize it. So what have we seen? Be an imitator of God as dear children. We've seen the reasons. Seen that defined. Be an imitator and walk as dear children. Walk in love. Be just like Christ. Be aware of what's fitting for us and not fitting. And be not deceived of the punishment to come. And then be aware of the sin. If you're here this morning, this evening, and you haven't obeyed the gospel, there is no better time than right now. Because we're not promised another day. We have uh, enough reasons, as we looked at the beginning of the lessons, to be an imitator. And the first step to be an imitator is to put on Christ in baptism. That's the first step. Maybe you're already a Christian, but you need to make things right in your life. Maybe you've got some filthiness, some problems in your life, covetousness or something you need to address. You need to address that now. Uh, we're not promised another, another day, another breath, another hour. And if you're subject to invitation, we would encourage you as we stand and sing.